All right. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, welcome to my talk on uh, how uh, Dremio's data lake house reduces TCO for analytics, right? Or uh, rather, how to reduce your cloud data warehousing cost uh, by a lot uh, by using a data lake house instead, right? What is a data lake house, you might ask? Uh, well, we'll get into that in just a moment, right? Uh, we'll start by diving into what are some of the cost drivers uh, that happen in times when we're using cloud data warehouses. Uh, and then uh, we'll also look into how to eliminate a lot of these cost drivers, right? Uh, when we move our workloads onto a data lake house architecture, right? And then finally, we'll look at some uh, real world uh, uh, examples using cloud data warehouses like Snowflake uh, to, to compare with, right? Uh, but, but it's hard to talk to you about a solution if you haven't talked about the problem yet. So uh, let us first uh, do that. Um, uh, being in the data lake house place, uh, space, uh, we in Dremio uh, talk to a lot of people who are uh, trying to improve their data platforms, right? And from them, we also hear a lot of problems that, we are, that they're having with their existing platforms, right? And some of the things that we hear from cloud data warehouse customers are that, you know, one, uh, there is a lot of uh, data lock-in, right? Uh, they cannot access their data efficiently except by using the data warehouse platform, right? If you want to export the data out, it can get expensive uh, to do so, right? Uh, you do see some movement away from that by certain cloud data vendors, uh, uh, cloud data, data warehouse vendors. Uh, you know, you see them trying to support open table formats, but it's still very much the fact that you have to get the data in something like Iceberg to get uh, the full advantage of the iceberg platform, right? Uh, it is not necessarily uh, or not ideal for uh, BI and cell service, right? So while there's a lot of ease of use and features in data warehouses, uh, at the end of the day, you still have these, uh, you still end up doing these old patterns of having things like BI extracts and cubes to improve BI performance, right? And oftentimes when uh, people take a look at, uh, hey, what is something like Snowflake costing, right? Uh, the cost of these additional workloads to create these BI cubes and BI extracts aren't generally factored in there, right? So uh, typically the costs actually end up being way more expensive than you realize when you actually factor in all the work that you need to do around the data warehouse to optimize that data warehouse, right? Uh, third, it's expensive to maintain, right? Uh, you guys know this uh, data team spend a lot of time and resources maintaining expensive queries, right? They optimize materialized views on top of that, right? Even things like cost of storage, right? You don't really factor that in, right? Because uh, you don't realize that you're tracking and storing historical versions of, the, of your data, right? Generally for something like 90 days or something like that, and you're paying for that, right? And all that can add up, right? Uh, things like egress and ingress costs from ETL, right? Which brings me to the last point here expensive media, right? So uh, when you're ingesting data from the data lake to the data warehouse, right? You're moving data outside of your data lake, right? So you're hitting those egress costs, right? And uh, these costs uh, add up, right? Uh, just the move movement of data from the data lake to the data warehouse, right? So you have all these costs that you generate operating a data warehouse, uh, but you also have the cost of getting the data into the data warehouse and the cost of optimizing the data warehouse itself not just your own workloads, but also the workloads of all other users of, of the platform. And in most cases, uh, uh, in some of these initial cost calculations, right, uh, you're just mostly focused on what your workload costs, and you're not really uh, focused on what all these additional factors uh, or additional cost drivers that drive those data warehousing bills uh, to be so large, right? Uh, so why is that, right? Uh, all that comes down to this uh, traditional approach uh, of, uh, you know, uh, data management, right? And trying to see, hey, is there a better way to do this, right? Uh, whether it's uh, Snowflake or some other cloud data warehouse, right? The pattern is still the same, right? And you run into uh, the same problems, right? So uh, what are the problems, right? Now, one, uh, you start off with uh, your sources, right? On, on the left-hand side over here, right? Which can be application databases, can be different files that are generated throughout your businesses, uh, SaaS applications a data like Salesforce or some third party app, right? You're collecting all sorts of different stuff and that typically ends uh, ends up in your data lake, right? Uh, why? Because the data lake is a place where you can store both structured and unstructured data. It is an inexpensive place to store data, right? And uh, on the data lake, uh, people typically do what's called a medallion architecture, right? They will land all the data in the bronze zone 
they will clean it, they will standardize it, move it into a silver zone, right? So it'll be a silver version of the data, and then they'll transform it one more time to make it ready for consumption. And that's a gold uh, layer, right? So right here, you have created like three copies already, right? Because you took the raw data, you transformed it into silver, you transformed that to gold, right? And then each time it's a physical copy in this traditional uh, pattern, right? And so you're generating costs there, right? And then what happens is you take the bits of your uh, gold data, uh, that you want in the data warehouse and you end up ETLing it into your uh, cloud data warehouse, right? Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, once once that, once you do that, you create the curated zone, right? Which is essentially a copy of the gold data, right? And then you start building your summary tables, right? Uh, you start building accelerations of those summary tables to help your BI dashboards, right? You're going to create processes around those materialized views, uh, right? And you're going to be, uh, uh, you're going to be worried about how to maintain those materialized views in the summary tables and to keep those in sync and updated and fresh and all of that, right? And then what happens is you generally tend to uh, uh, generate departmental data mods, right? Which is going to be some combination of some logical views, right? But you know, a, a lot of times you're creating additional copies, right? So that people within these departments can then work and make their uh, make their changes, uh, work with the data in their own way, right? So then there are more physical copies, right? And each of these data movements also means there is programming code, right? ETL code that have to be written, right? This code has to be tested. This code has to be deployed. This code, ha this code has to be managed, right? Uh, and, and it just gets more complex, uh, which means it takes a longer, increasing your time to insights because you're taking longer to get that insight, right? And all this increase your costs, right? Uh, you're spending compute to do this. You're spending more compute to do this. You're increasing the amount of your storage uh, footprint, right? And you can see how this gets expensive uh, really quickly, right? And I'm sure you experienced this with your cloud builds, with your data warehousing builds, right? And, and that's why you're in this session. Uh, you're generating all these extracts and cubes as well, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, these are external to the data warehouse, right? Uh, because you, you know, things like tablet extracts or Power Bay imports, right? You create a separate collections of these pre-aggregated data and, and this gets expensive and complicated, right? And the thing is, the more complicated all of this gets, right? The less self-serve it gets, right? So uh, we get away from the desire of being, uh, uh, desire of being able to allow our data analysts and data analysts and, and data scientists to be able to have more direct access to the data that they can provide for them so they can provide for themselves we start having these data copies everywhere, right? And because there is so many versions of data, right? All of this data have to be governed if you want to comply with, you know, governance regulations and stuff like that, right? It, the, this gets really hard to govern all of this data across all of these different systems, right? Uh, and then, you know, uh, the data in your data warehouse, as I mentioned before, it gets locked in, right? Uh, generally, the data warehouse has some proprietary internal format. Uh, and if you, you know, decide, you know what, let me move on to another data warehouse, uh, or some other tool, right? Guess what? You're going to have to move into that platform, right? Into some other proprietary format, right? Again, more retail, more costs, right? You, you, you get the picture, right? Ideally, you would want to have uh, uh, that time to insight to be as minimum as possible, right? If you would get as close to an instantaneous time to insight, wouldn't you do that, right? Um, so uh, uh, how do we do this? The idea is to take these data consumers you see over here and basically what we call is what would you call as you know shifting them left right so we shift these left right uh, which is now currently pointed to the cloud data warehouse space we are going to shift them left to be more on the data lake space right uh, and that means we get to treat our data lake as a data warehouse right and that is what we call as a data lake house right um, so let's look at what makes up a, a, a data lake house, right? It's got a lot of different pieces. Uh, think about it this way, right? You start on the bottom over here, right? You've got your object storage. That can be your S3, your Azure storage, or a Google Cloud storage, right? Uh, and what you want to do is uh, you want the files, your Parquet files, your ORC files, your Avro files, right? That have landed in the data lake to be treated as tables, right? And that's where the uh, open table format comes into picture, right? Uh, the open table formats, uh, things like Iceberg, right? They allow you to identify different groups of files as as tables, right? And uh, more often than not, you don't have just one big table. Uh, you have lots of tables, right? Uh, and and you need a way to track all these tables, and that's where a catalog comes in, right? Uh, the catalog helps you discover these tables across multiple tools. 
And, and what's the point of being able to track your tables if you're not going to do any analytical uh, and, and analytics with it, right? You need a query engine for that, right? And that's going to be able to, you know, a query engine is going to be able to run queries and do transformations and do all kinds of processing work you want to do on that data. And finally, uh, at the end of the day for your end users, you want to deliver the data in a way that is easy for them to understand, easy for them to find and discover, and that's also well governed, right? And that's why you need a semantic layer, right? Uh, traditionally, semantic layer always has been part of API tools. Here, it'll be it'll make a lot more sense if you offload that semantic layer logic into your data lake cause, right? Uh, uh, this is a place where your users can go and get a unified view of their data, right? To be able to discover the data that they can uh, uh, to discover data to uh, uh, to bring it into their different use cases, whether it's data science workloads or dashboards or building data applications, right? And being able to use you know standard interfaces to grab the data, things like ODBC, JDBC, and REST APIs and stuff like that, right? Uh, but also in this picture, there's one more thing, right? Uh, most of your data in your data lake uh, is treated as tables through these table formats, right? Uh, but not all of your data is ever going to be in the data lake, right? Uh, you may have some data that might be just, uh, you know, from a marketplace, right? You might get it from AWS's data sharing marketplace, right? You might have data just sitting out in Snowflake because you're using Snowflake's data marketplace, right? You may have other data that is sitting out in um, uh, in a database that it just isn't worth moving to the data lake, right? You would rather just operate it directly uh, from the database itself, right? So in this data lake house platform, uh, ideally for the enterprise grade data lake house, uh, you would want to have some sort of virtualization, right? To be able to virtualize that uh, long tail of additional data, right? Uh, think of it as an 80-20 uh, rule where you want 80% of your data on your data lake, but you're still going to have 20% of data coming from all these other sources. Uh, uh, so you need a tool that can give access to that additional 20%, right? Along with giving you a platform to unify all of these uh, 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 pieces that make a, a data lake house and make it usable. And that is essentially what something like uh, Dremio provides, right? Uh, Dremio is a data lake house platform. It is a unified uh, data lake house platform for self-service analytics, right? You can connect your object stores, right? Whether that's Azure Storage or S3 or Google Cloud Storage or even on-prem data sources, right? Things like uh, Minaya or Fast Data or NetApp or any of the uh, data lake uh, uh, storage vendors, right? You can have a hybrid lake house that, right? Some data on your cloud data, uh, cloud storage, and some data on your on-prem storage, right? You can connect. You know, as mentioned, that long tail of additional sources, things like Dremere can connect to uh, Snowflake and uh, NoSQL databases like MongoDB and Elasticsearch and Postgres and SQL Server and all sorts of these other unique sources, right? Uh, it provides you with the things that you need to tie things together, right? Dremere provides the semantic layer that we talked about, right? So you have that nice view where your end users can easily discover data and, and that data can be documented, can also be governed. Right. Everything in the semantic layer is done uh, virtually, so there are no copies of the data. Right. It also provides a SQL query engine. Right. Uh, Dremio is going to provide the best in class price per performance, right, with all sorts of features of accelerations. Right. Uh, it's going to give you that data lake house management features. Right. Uh, it comes with a catalog that's built in. Right. Uh, it's going to provide you know automatic table format optimization and garbage collection, all of that stuff. Uh, so that way, you know the feel of using the data lake house, it feels like using a cloud data warehouse, right? It has that one unified uh, platform view, right? And you still have that open nature. You're still, you know, shifting left, right? You're moving all these workloads to your data lake, right? Uh, but you have the platform that feels like a cloud data warehouse, right? It has that ease of use factor, right? Uh, and then you can pass the data to your data science uh, uh, dashboards and your applications, right? Um, so let's dig in a little bit deeper. I won't spend too much time on this slide. Uh, again, uh, Dremio is enabling a lot of this uh, through its uh, unified access layer, right? You can see that we give you an easy view, right? It's nice and organized in one place, right? Minimal copies of your data because everything that you do in Dremio semantic layer is all virtual, right? Uh, Dremio provides a SQL query engine, right? It allows you to easily query that engine, uh, uh, query the data, but also quickly, right? Uh, speed also means less cost, right? So if you don't have to ETL the data in into the data warehouse, you save money on that, right? Uh, you're using less storage, so you save money on that. If your queries run faster, you save on compute over there. 
and then also you're using cheaper compute, you save money on that as well, right? So you can see where all of these cost savings are going to come from, right? And then you have the lake house management, right? Uh, ideally, those iceberg tables, those lake house tables, you would want them to keep them optimized, right? Uh, so ideally, you get uh, things like iceberg compaction, right? Uh, it cleans up all of the unused files, right? So that way, you're not spending more than you need to on storage, right? And that way, your queries are never slower than they uh, need to be because your data sets are optimized, right? Uh, which again, as I mentioned, faster queries means uh, saved money, right? More efficient queries uh, means uh, less long and shorter running uh, compute, right? Um, so how would you bring all of that together, right? Uh, we are not saying go and uh, uh, get rid of your Snowflake or Redshift or Teradata. We're not getting, we're not telling you to pull out of them, right? Uh, there are a lot of reasons uh, for you to still use these cloud data warehouses, right? For example, you know, as mentioned, Snowflake has a data marketplace, right? It, it can be useful to acquire data sets, right? But instead, the idea is to, you know, start shifting left, right, and bring all of these workloads directly to your uh, uh, data lake, right, uh, to your data lake house platform, right? And that's when you start seeing a lot of these cost reductions, right? You see reduction in the amount of storage costs, right? Uh, reduction amount of ingress and egress costs, right? Uh, you're not moving data into your data warehousing platform as much anymore, right? Uh, you see a reduction in the cost of ETL, right? Uh, uh, you know, especially ETL that, uh, that you do to uh, create that additional movement to generate all those data models, right? Instead, you can virtually model all of that uh, 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 data in a lake house, right? not, not make a billion copies of it, right? And then you're able to govern all that data, right? Including that long tail of additional data on those non-data lake sources, all from one place, right? So if you look at this diagram, Right, you now have the vast majority of uh, data in batch sources, which then you do ETL and you land them into your data lake as before. This is not changing, but instead you're landing them into an, an iceberg table, right? And this would be tracked by your uh, iceberg uh, catalog, right? And then you know, uh, 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 you know, Dremio would be that interface to manage and uh, work on your data lake, right? Providing you with that uh, UI, right? But it can also connect to your data warehouses, right? Premier can connect to Snowflake and Redshift, right? And so you'll be able to see those shared data sets uh, that you're using, right? You can still use those data sets to enrich your lake house, right? And then deliver the data to your uh, data science notebooks and applications and BI tools and all of that, right? Uh, the Dremio engine itself has a lot of other things, you know, uh, that it does under the hood to further decrease your costs. It has a lot of caching, right? So that it does not, uh, you don't need to access S3 as much. So it does not hit S3 as often. So you save on S3 access costs. You, uh, Dremio has things like reflections to speed up queries even faster. Right, uh, without having the typical he headaches of materialized views, and you know, Dremio uh, kind of does all that management and it allows uh, to be much more usable. Right, so you don't have to create as as much of as many reflections or as many materialized views uh, as needed. Right, uh, your analysts or data scientists don't even need to know that they exist. Right, because Dremio will intelligently use those reflections to speed up uh, the queries on the right data sets. Right, um, so. Uh, you know, uh, the idea is, you know, uh, it, uh, your users just go explore, get the data that they're looking for and just query, right? Without worrying about where my data is or, or without worrying about which is the best optimized version of the, of the data that I need to use, right? And, you know, in a way, uh, in a quick and efficient way, reducing that time to insight, right? All right, so let's uh, uh, look at some real world examples, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, this is some examples comparing with Snowflake, right? Here we have a company that's looking at a three year total cost of ownership on their an analytical platform. Uh, so here uh, we're looking at the end to end TCU of analytics, right? So basically all the costs that we mentioned earlier, right? That you would incur using something like Snowflake, right? Uh, so uh, things like the different ETL costs, the egress costs, and you know, uh, the compute costs and all of that, right? Here we're comparing a Dremio large cluster, which is um, eight nodes, right? Uh, versus a uh, Snowflake large warehouse, right? And you can see here uh, with Dremio, you see uh, a cost over three years, right? Of 1.4 million versus Snowflake's 2.9 million, right? Uh, when you break it all down, right? And that's a 50% workload, right? And this is just one example with Snowflake. Uh, some customers have seen more than 50% in different situations. Uh, it's a transformative thing, right? Because uh, think about the stuff that you can do with the money that you save, right? Uh, what data projects currently that aren't being funded that you can now fund, right? Uh, it not only really gets insights faster, but increase the types of insights that you're getting, right? And that savings can go a, a long way, right? There's a lot of value beyond just you know, dollars and cents, right? 
Um, here's another uh, example of a customer who had 75% TCO savings, right? Uh, uh, 3 million savings in just one department of the company, right? So imagine if they adopted this pattern in all of their departments, right? Uh, so basically the original story is that they were using uh, Snowflake, right? Uh, you can see here, they have data on uh, S3, they move it into Snowflake, uh, they create, uh, they generate extracts, they create, uh, uh, generate all the data marts, right? They extract 700 million uh, records of data uh, into Tableau, right? And, and even with the extract, right, uh, it would take about four minutes per usage of the dashboard, right? So let's say someone was turning a knob on the dashboard and to see the data a little bit different, they would have to wait three to four minutes uh, you know, uh, per click, right? Again, that's not necessarily the time time to insight that you're looking for, right? With Dremio, it got a lot more simpler, right? They just landed their data in the data lake, which, which they were doing already, right? And this is just one copy of the data, right? And Dremio is sitting on top, deliver the data directly on top of, uh, the, directly to Tableau. Uh, they, there was no need to do Tableau extracts, right? They were all live queries and they were able to reduce it uh, from three to four minutes to five to 15 seconds uh, uh, per usage of the dashboard or, or per click, right? And then at the end of the day, this is what matters, right? Uh, it allowed the business uh, decisions uh, to be made more, much more faster, right? Uh, you're able to get uh, that nimbleness, right? You're able to make those decisions quick, right? And you need a platform that can allow you to do all of that, right? Uh, here's another example, right? Uh, uh, you know, this is where we see 91% lower TCO compared with Dremio, uh, with Dremio compared to Snowflake, right? Uh, this company was a global leader in uh, uh, in the manufacturing of commercial vehicles, right? Uh, now, again, what happened here is they were using Snowflake. Uh, they compared a workload, uh, uh, you know, the same workload on Dremio versus the same workload on Snowflake. It cost them $47 uh, to run that same workload uh, on, on, on Snowflake, right, using Azure and AWS. Right uh, and uh, comparing that with uh, Dremio on the data lake, right? It was it was much more cheaper, right? Uh, uh, you know, there is quite a difference in savings uh, to do the same work, right? Again, with Dremio, there is no data movement, right? No no need to copy uh, the data uh, because again, we are capturing the the full data here, right? The, the full picture here, right? Um, all right. Uh, here's uh, uh, another example, right? Uh, this is going to be my last example. Uh, uh, you know, we see here is uh, Dremio working with a large pharmaceutical company, right? And basically, uh, the workloads uh, were primarily on Azure, right? So basically, as a comparison, uh, we ran those same workloads on on Dremio uh, using Parquet files on Azure storage, right? Using a 10 node, 120 gig, uh, 16 CP machine, right? And uh, Snowflake Wood was using the extra large uh, uh, cluster. Uh, so this is the apples to apples comparison. Uh, so what what happened here is they ran those same workloads and uh, uh, it took 30 seconds for that workload to complete, but those same workloads in Dremio took about uh, seven seconds, right? So again, it's quite a bit faster over three times uh, faster. But the thing is, you know, th think about it, right? If you can get data insights faster, uh, you can get the data faster to make those nimble decisions that we talked about, right? And you're able to transform your business faster. And you know, that's huge, right? Uh, all right, so let's sum it up, right? Uh, Dremio is a, a, a Dremio, a lake house a solution versus a typical data warehouse, right? Uh, from the data engineering standpoint, right? Uh, data ingest, we talked about this, right? Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, data is already on the data lake. You do not need to ingest data, uh, but with data warehouses, you do need to do that, and that can incur costs, right? Granted, again, as mentioned, you know, uh, there are external table features that some data warehouses have, but again, to get the full performance of the data warehouses, uh, uh, you know, they would recommend you to load the data into uh, data warehouses, right? That means you're going to have the uh, ingestion costs, right? Or you're going to have those egress costs and those additional storage costs, right? Data transformation. Uh, with Dremio, it's it's virtual, right? You do not make copies of your data. You do uh, last mile ETL to add columns or to or remodel some data. Right, and a lot of that can be done virtually with performance, right? And that's where Dremio's secret sauce is, right? It's able to create that virtual data, the virtual data mods to make it practical, right? And with data warehouses, you should create these items, but then they're all physical copies, right? Uh, you are making physical copies of your data. Again, more copies means more work, more code, uh, more governance work, right? Uh, and plus all that storage costs, right? Uh, long haul transformations. Uh, well, this is not a, a, a Dremio uh, feature yet, right? Like, for example, what I mean by a major transformation is like you're converting a file format from uh, Avro to Parquet or Avro to Iceberg or something like that, right? This is not a core capability of Dremio yet. So ideally, you would want to pair Dremio with something like uh, Spark, right? 
uh, um, but of course, in from a data warehousing plan, uh, standpoint, this is their bread and butter, right? You can easily do this, but yeah, you know, it typically tends to uh, be expensive when you are doing this directly in the data warehouse as compared to uh, using something like Spark, right? Uh, now, as far as the user experience goes, right? Uh, Dremio, uh, Dremio semantic layer are built in, right? It's what uh, it's it's part of what makes uh, Dremio unique, right? It is the user interface where your users can easily discover and organize and curate uh, data without moving data, without creating copies, right? With data warehouses, it's not available. You kind of need there isn't a semantic layer. You kind of pair with third-party services like uh, you know Tableau or Power BI or Rascal or something like that. Right? Uh, it's more easier to configure things uh, uh, and more uh, it's more easy to configure things with Dremio. But with third-party applications, it's more stuff to integrate right? if you're using a data warehouse uh, with with these third-party tools, right? Uh, acceleration, Dremio has things like caching, right? It's worth caching uh, uh, things that you know uh, get queried very often, right? So you don't have to keep fetching data from S3. It's got things like collections that we talked about. Data warehouses do have materialized views and materialized aggregates, but then there is a lot of maintenance work, right? Uh, you kind of your users have to be trained on which materialized view to use, right? Uh, uh, you, they cannot use the original table. You know, some some data warehouses have this table redirect uh, functionality, but then again, it's just maybe only one table redirects at at, at max, right? With Dremio, you can use uh, any number of tables, right, within uh, to to be redirected, right? Data curation federation, it's easy to do with Dremio, right? Uh, everything is virtual in in Dremio. Right, you can create things like external reflections. Right, uh, with 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 data warehouses, it's kind of like you have the details. Right, so there's no virtual way of, of doing stuff. Right, you can create views and stuff, but then more often than not, you end up creating uh, copies. Right, and materializing these views. Right, and as as far as query redirects goes, right, uh, this is the cool thing about Dremio. Dremio can automatically rewrite uh, rewrite your queries. Right. Uh, it, this is where the reflection features comes in, right? It creates reflections to speed up uh, raw queries, right? Uh, things like uh, reflections, uh, you know, uh, when a query comes in for the original data sets, Dremio will automatically use the reflection. Your users not need, need not even worry about uh, uh, which reflections to use and all of that, right? Dremio just does that automatically for you, right? So uh, it's not just about cost, it's also about ease of use, right? And, and uh, Dremio's whole purpose is to make things easier, efficient, right? Okay. So uh, that was just it about my presentation, right? Uh, there is a QR code here. Uh, it gives you a lot more details on what I've talked about today, including a white paper. You can scan this QR code to access it.